Hello, my name is Gregor Giebel. I'm head of section for renewable plants and weather-driven energy systems at DTU Wind. I have 25 years of experience in energy meteorology and today I will tell you about forecasting of wind power. First of all, um, I want to motivate why we need the forecasts. Um, then I'll show you a little bit on how we do them, both deterministic and probabilistic forecasts. Um, and then I'll give you a little outlook on specialized forecasts such as ramp forecasts. In the power system of the past, um, we had large scale uh, power plants like hydro, coal, nuclear, that then distributed the power out um, to the consumers. In the current system, um, we are already having quite a number of wind power plants onshore and offshore. Um, we got some solar plants um, involved as well. We still have the old scale um, plants, but we also see some solar plants at the consumers. We, we see some um, takeoff, uh, increased takeoff for transport at the consumers. Um, and in the future, um, we are looking into a power system that is driven mostly by wind and solar. So we are having more of all the same. We got rid of most of the coal power plants and gas power plants. Um, we still will have some hydropower plants. Um, and the whole system is going to be both more distributed and more reliant on the weather. For the past system, we don't really need much in terms of um, forecasts of renewables. In the current system, um, we already need a forecast for wind power and a forecast for solar power and maybe a forecast for distributed solar power. But in the future system where everything is connected and everything is dependent on each other, we need forecasts that also have the correct correlations, um, including on the longer time timescales. If you look at an average day in Europe, um, then here in 2020, we had about 10% or so of wind power averaged over the entire day, averaged over the entire Europe. Um, and you can see in this case, um, the Iberian Peninsula had a bit more. Um, in other cases, Denmark and the Nordic countries um, and um, the north of Germany have a bit more. But that's an average day. Um, and in some times, um, we get it actually up to 32% of wind power. And in, uh, in another time, um, we only went down to 4% of wind power. And that's this kind of day ahead power in feet um, that we need to know. So how do we do those forecasts? First of all, we start um, with numerical weather prediction, that is the weather models that you know from um, the TV forecasts, um, except that we use the, uh, the output of those models directly. That then is given um, to us uh, and converted into power by using a power curve, um, and I'll come to, back to that in a second. The power curve is estimated together with online data and the online data from the wind turbines also is needed to make the forecasts better for the first few hours. Then um, we get predictions for the wind power out of that and that then goes to the end users, be it um, grid companies or traders um, or anyone else. The weather prediction is essentially a system with 10 to the 7 um, points of data input um, that needs to be run by um, the very large scale weather centers around the world. NOAA, um, like here in this picture, uh, DMI in Denmark, um, Deutsche Wetterdienst in Germany, um, ECMWF, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts in Reading, and so on. And they produce a forecast that then um, goes out for some days or maybe up to 16 days for the entire globe uh, and then make a um, smaller dedicated forecast for a, la for a smaller area. But that to calculate takes some four, six, eight hours. So by the time you actually get the result, um, these forecasts are notionally already six or eight hours uh, um, old. In order to combat that um, for some very short term forecasts, there's the op opportunity to do some um, rapid refresh models where they run every hour, but only 
as far out um, as they can on the computer systems they have or within that hour. That's typically 24 hours because the higher resolution that this model actually gets um, is getting washed out in the longer run anyway. From these numerical weather prediction models, we then use the um, wind speed and direction, typically near Hapate, um, and feed them into a statistical power curve. And that statistical power curve is usually estimated from, um, from a 2D field and estimated versus actual measured data. So um, this power curve takes the numerical weather prediction wind speed, the numerical weather prediction direction, and the measured power um, and estimates this 2D power curve. In some cases, people are doing up to six or eight dimensions of power curves, but to visualize that on this 2D screen is really difficult. Often that is actually done by machine learning. But what do we actually get out of it? If we have a forecast like this one, this um, is equivalent of the unconstrained wind farm production. That means um, how much would that wind farm be producing if everything would work um, according to specifications. But that's not always the case that we have. Sometimes we have limited turbine availability and if it's like in some um, offshore cases, a, a turbine that has burned and is not going to be replaced, then you're just having a new normal. But in the more normal cases, um, you're having a maintenance crew out at the wind farm, um, shutting down the turbine for the day, doing some maintenance um, and shutting it, uh, putting it on again afterwards. And in those cases, um, we usually know beforehand which turbines um, the maintenance crew would actually um, tackle. But it could also be a third case um, that we have grid curtailment, that um, in the entire region you have so much wind energy that you can't evacuate all the wind from that region. And then wind um, plants are being asked to not produce fully on and sometimes even not produce at all. So then all these three effects um, you have to know um, and you especially have to take care to um, eliminate them from your training set because otherwise um, you are training um, your power curve against something that just isn't there. Another thing that is interesting is the wind speed errors are actually relatively uniform across the entire spectrum. They increase a little bit with the wind speed, um, but not much. You can say it's about one, one and a half meters per second error um, across the board. But if you put that through the power curve, as we've seen, um, an error at the higher margin, in the flat part of the power curve, essentially it doesn't uh, matter at all because you're, uh, the power is not going to change. An error in the steep part of the power curve, though, means um, that this will be largely amplified. Um, and that's also what we see here. If you look um, over the predicted wind speed um, and look at the error, then the error is actually the highest um, in that upper steep part of the power curve. Now we've talked a little bit about errors. There are essentially two different kinds of errors. One is a phase error and one is a level error. The level error is if I'm just not getting the intensity of the wind correct for some reason. So I'm, I'm having some offset here between the actual production and the forecast. That's um, one of the main error sources, the, uh, but the other one is actually more typical. And that is a phase error, um, also called a timing error. And here I'm having a increase in power, typically a low pressure system that moves somewhere. Um, and it's, I, I've predicted it a little bit later than it actually came. So this is um, the phase error and while it looks roughly the same here and here, um, due to the fact that we evaluate the errors at every hour, um, the phase errors often um, have a larger impact on the normal error measures. And since these timing errors are so difficult, um, we also see that um, we have a clear dependency between the variability of my wind power time series 
and the error measure. Uh, so if, if you have um, this down here is a measure of the variability of the wind power in feed. And you see um, that for high variability, also this error measure for the total um, wind speed is high. And that's true for individual wind farms and also larger regions. And um, what, what you also see is that for entire regions or country size, you're actually getting down to quite low RMSEs, um, root mean square errors, in terms of um, capacity. That all was deterministic forecasts. Um, now let's take a look at probabilistic forecasts. Uh, another way for the numerical weather prediction providers um, to increase the usefulness of their forecasts is to give us an estimate um, of the uncertainty of the weather situation. And they do that, I said it's 10 to the 7 data points around the planet. That means we don't have a data point for every few centimeters, we have a data point for every few kilometers. In between there could be quite some variation in the weather um, and also there's some uncertainty of the actual data point. So the weather institutes um, do feed that into the weather model with a slight variation and then you see how sensitive it is to that variation. Here in this case, for the first couple of days, the weather is pretty stable um, under any circumstance. Then we are going to have a rise of which some of the 50 ensemble members that ECMWF here is showing um, are not totally sure when it is um, or how large it is. And then it's more difficult to predict. So here um, the weather is uh, essentially all over the place. What I then can do is, um, instead of having all these individual members, I can say how many of my members are in a certain range. And then I get a 50% percentile and a 90% um, percentile, a 10% percentile, so that I can see what, what is the spread. And I see there's little spread here, there's lots spread here, and there's also quite a large spread in this area. But the ensemble quantiles that come out of the um, weather models directly um, are not necessarily the right quantiles for my particular wind farm. Um, as we see here, um, in this case, it looks like um, the quantiles actually do match. In this, in this case, um, they don't. And therefore, I need to adjust my quantiles so that they actually fit to the wind farm in question. Now let's get to the last topic of specialized forecasts. Um, I'll have three examples. Uh, one is, what is a ramp? Um, a ramp could be 20% in, in, in 30 minutes, 20% um, in one hour, 40% in two hours. Um, it depends on the definition of what a ramp is and the definition of the ramp usually, uh, of, or the definition of a critical ramp usually depends on the receiving power system. And one possible approach is um, we've seen that the uh, best overall error measures um, are actually gotten by forecasts that are relatively smooth. So in this case, where we want to have the ramps emphasized, we actually want to have dedicated ramp forecasts and um, those often can come out of the ensemble members. Another specialized forecast is a wind speed and um, significant wave height forecast for offshore installations. Um, and if you think that you have this rotor here, uh, then you don't want to have too much wind on your rotor while it dangles from the crane so that you can actually put it onto the nacelle and that's typically 10 meters per second or so. So in summary, we've learned about deterministic and probabilistic forecasts. We've learned about phase errors and level errors. We've learned about um, that there are the biggest errors at medium wind speeds, which unfortunately are the most frequent wind speeds. And we've also seen that some specialized uses actually need specialized forecasts.